Welcome to the Tricord Advisors podcast, where we answer life's hard questions to help you make smart decisions with your money. I'm Jeremiah Lee, and this is Randy Barkley. We're both certified financial planners. I'm also a California licensed attorney. And we're here to talk about what I call as the bank idiocy. What happened with Silicon Valley Bank and how the repercussions of that has impacted not only bank stocks, but also has affected the overall general marketplace. Because Banks are perceived as an entity that you put money into, you expect it to be safe, right? Yeah. Even it's funny, you can go back to the architecture of banks, physical banks. Right. They they used to be big vaults, and whatnot. And today the money's not actually kept there, but they still want big pillars. And you know, <laughs> it's they, the image. It makes it feel this is a secure, this is a stable place. And I'm sure everyone's been inundated with with discussion about SVB, Silicon Valley Bank, uh, what's happened this week. And we're, we're not trying to pile on, but trying to hopefully cut through some of the noise that people are hearing and, and say, okay, what, what actually happened? Right. Um, and what does that mean for the rest of the market? Yeah. And Silicon Valley Bank, they got into trouble, not because they invested in bad things. They didn't mm-hmm. have bad loans. It wasn't like a crypto bank or something. No, not at all. Not at all. And this has, this has no reflection on the mortgage-backed securities that was created all kinds of problems back in 2008 mm-hmm. through 2009. That has nothing to do with it. It has everything to do with the fact the Federal Reserve started increasing interest rates and the bank did not adjust their portfolio of treasuries. And this is really important for our listening audience to understand. They were affected because they were holding treasuries, which most banks do hold, but they dated them long. In other words, they bought 20 and 30 year treasuries to get a little bit more interest, not understanding what was going to happen to the value of those treasuries as interest rates rose within the marketplace. So I I think this is a great thing to start from. And we need to start from the beginning that Silicon Valley Bank has been around for a while. About 40 years. And they more recently have grown significantly. Yeah. And they became the bank for Silicon Valley. So a lot of venture capital uh, in some cases, uh, you know, IT, uh, uh, not so much in crypto, but they received a lot of money. Yeah, and so, all these are companies, right? They're, yeah, they're not just people putting their money in, but these are right. com- companies who have operating accounts. And my understanding is that they were, in order to attract deposits and get more money into their bank, they were offering better rates than other people were. So a bank, once it gets above uninsured amounts, so you hear you hear the comment, how much of their deposits were insured. That means the deposits that were under that $250,000 mandate by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation that protected the depositor, how much was above that? Well, they had mm. almost 90% of their deposits were above that two fifty. Wow. So these were very wealthy individuals or companies that were using uh, Silicon Valley as a depository. Right. And that's a great, I guess, comment to say that most people, you know, probably most listeners, uh, when they go down to their local bank, they put their money into the bank. Right. They probably have less than $250,000 in cash. Some people carry a lot of cash, might have more than that, but majority of individuals are going to have less than $250,000 of cash. And so they're covered by FDIC insurance. And some folks, even if they want to carry a lot of cash, will use maybe two banks. They'll split up their deposits right. to keep the accounts under two hundred fifty. dollars The issue with Silicon Valley, just like you said, 90% of everything was above the $250,000 per account. So these are very large accounts we're, we're talking about. And, and what happens to that money? Like you said, if, if it's not insured by FDIC, what is it? And so if it's if the deposit amount is going to uninsured, the bank can, can go into what they call the Certificate of Deposit Account Registry Service. In other words, that's where a bank says, okay, we've got too much money that's uninsured. So they start spreading that risk. Mm. So they go into this service run by the Treasury and they spread those deposits amongst other banks. So they create, they stay within that 250000 Ah, but here's the issue. If they keep it, they can pay a little bit more interest rate to depositors, attracting more money. Ah. So what happened is they wanted to continue to get the, they wanted to be the bank. They wanted to be the bank of choice for the internet or the high-tech Silicon Valley area. And so they got more money than they could handle, and to, basically. And to do that, to become that key bank, they wanted to pay the highest interest. Exactly. Say, hey, no one else is paying great interest. We, right. I mean, one of the... the the comments we read was that they were paying 5.28 on large deposits. So over 5%. So if you're looking around at banks and you got a million dollars in a corporate account and you say, Hey, this bank, if we give it to them, they'll pay us 5%. Okay, let's move banks. And so right. they were, a lot of people were moving. And so they became the bank, just like I said, they became the bank of choice. They're offering more, but because of that, they didn't want to go down to that spread out the risk, charge less 
They want to be more attracted to large depositors. And the problem that I see is they should have contacted those clients and said, you're now uninsured. They should have put a warning of risk out to those clients. And then the clients can make the decision. Well, we trust you. We'll leave it. Where is, you know, a lot of these companies are public companies. They probably have some kind of risk management within their companies. Mm -hmm. They could go in and talk to the controller of the bank and say, where, where's your assets? Where are the deposits at? And they could take an evaluation of what kind of risk the bank may be putting their money under over and above that two hundred fifty thousand yeah. dollar limit. And for an individual listening, if you have you know twenty thousand dollars in your bank and you walk in, and I'd like to talk to the president. Where is my money being? You're right. probably not going to get very far. Right. They'll probably tell you that the pat answer. But it, some of these banks, if they have twenty million, thirty million in some of these accounts, then uh, yeah, they're going to get a, a front door seat right to the the president and kind of talk through this stuff. So Silicon Valley Bank has you know we just talked about ninety percent uninsured amounts and and the other one is a signature Valley but Signature oh, yeah. Bank of New York. And pretty much the same. And the architect of the banking structure, Barney Frank, who retired from Massachusetts. And this is kind of ironic because Elizabeth Warren basically took his position in Congress and or in the Senate. And Barney Frank now sits on the board of directors for the Signature Bank. And they ran into the same problem except with crypto. Mm. And my attitude is those depositors should have been told. Yeah. And I think the bank just didn't want to be that... Uh, transparent with them because yeah. they might lose those accounts. Yeah, they want the deposits, and I mean, wow, what a good footnote for for being greedy about things, right? To say don't don't get out over your skis, I think is the right. phrase, but to say okay, we we can do good for our clients and and not having to push that extra amount just to get more. So, uh, a comment that we talked about earlier is is had the deposit at Silicon Valley Bank never pulled out the money, had they just left it just there, they there. didn't need it. These long dated bonds, these treasury long dated treasuries that Silicon Valley Bank had invested in. My understanding, they would have been fine because they would have paid it's, the interest. It's, it would have been yeah, a good, it, good cycle. However, yeah. interest rates changed going up and up and up, which now made these these the value of these bonds are holding fall down. And people said, well, I'd like my money back. And that became the issue. And, and that's normal for banks, right? I, I think everyone knows at this point that if you go to a bank, it's not like a Scrooge McDuck where they have a giant vault in the back and all the money's sitting. The money there. has to be invested. It, yeah. I mean, if you if you have a large deposit in the bank, they're not just going to put that money in cash. They have to earn interest on yeah, that money. How, how do they invest it? Right? This even goes back to, uh, what's the movie? It's a Wonderful Life. It's a Wonderful Life. For Christmas, it's, that, that and, famous and, scene. And that was a Jimmy Stewart moment, right? Yeah, right. He says, the money's not here. The money's in his house. <laughs> it's in your house. And it's, it's in that loan. Yeah. You know, they, they spread out and invest it. And that's, what, that's how banks work. But banks have to be mindful of, and they, and they do, and there's regulations and there's there's things they're supposed to be following. Is, is kind of what's, what's a long-term investment, like a 30-year mortgage? And what's a shorter term investment to say, okay, we have it in a T-bill on the market. And there's, you know, there's ratios they try and, you know, one's, I'm sure there's rules about, but also just good practices of where they try and keep that, knowing that if people need their money back, you have to have a certain amount that's available. And with Silicon Valley Bank, be, because so many people wanted their money back, the bank was invested, uh, from our view, poorly in the long term and short term. Yeah, I mean, they, they move money into long term holdings. And then when short term interest rates started to rise... Well, they knew that they had a large deposit of long, long dated treasuries. They would take a loss. They would take a discount if they sold those in the marketplace and move their deposits over into short term. They did not hedge themselves. Mm-hmm. And their risk management officer had actually left uh, eight months ago and had not been replaced. So internally, there was all these problems per se. And again, the bank failed not because it made bad loans. Mm. That's that's really what I want you know our listening bad audience bad. to understand. This is not that issue. It's that they did not take their deposits and spread them out yeah. through this registry. In other words, to ensure those deposits no matter what. And they yeah. could they could have they prevented could have all this. And, and that might be a, a good connection point to 2008, like you were saying earlier. You know, in 2008, people were investing in mortgage back, mortgage backed securities. Washington Mutual is the prime example. Yeah. I mean, they went down and they were the largest bank failure. And when you looked under the hood of what they actually were holding, it was not nearly the quality and the ability as what right. had been advertised. And that's different here. It wasn't that it the, the the actual investments that Silicon Valley Bank were poor or that they were um, of a low quality is simply that I guess a timing issue, right? right. They, they were very long term investments. And it's not that prudent to be putting into long-term investments as interest rates are going up. You know, for our investments, what we do with our clients, we've 
moved a lot of the, the bond positions to short-term bonds. Yeah, we started shorting our durations on our bonds. I mean, that's something we just do as a natural risk management. But again, we're actively involved in the risk management of our clients' portfolios. Yeah. So when interest rates, and we knew by the end of 21, it was pretty evident to us and everybody else that we were talking to that interest rates were going to rise. We didn't know to what extreme. Yeah. And I can't imagine that the risk officer inside of Silicon Valley Bank wasn't aware of that. Yeah. I think they were just hoping that they wouldn't rise so much that it would affect their long dated portfolios. Yeah. Um, we were naturally concerned about that. And we started to shorten the durations yeah. on our, our clients' portfolios for the bonds and such as that. Yeah. But it's interesting what economists you look at, and what, what, you know, who was talking, how, who had their ear for Silicon right. Valley Bank. You know, some economists said, hey, we're, we've hit the worst of it. We're coming out of it. Or interest rates won't, won't go that far. The Fed, federal chairman, you know, Chairman Powell, has been very... He's, I think he's tried to be as direct as he possibly He's can. very transparent. Yeah, very and, and trying transparent. to be, right? I think yep. he has a hard job because he puts an and or, a, or an if in a, in a sentence and the market's react. <laughs> so he's yeah. very much sure. trying to just be straightforward. This is what we're doing. And he said, we're going to raise interest rates. We're going to do it. And, and he has done it. And you know, whether they believed him or not. So I think it's an interesting aspect of where we, you know, Silicon Valley Bank, where it's gotten to. And I, I think this shift, we're going to take a quick break, but the shift we want to take next is kind of what do we do with this like, right where do we go from here what do we think about the rest of the markets and so so we're gonna take a quick break but stay tuned come on back we're gonna talk about um, banks and what you should be doing <laughs> 